The House of the Lord 412 Youth Ministry is partnering with Temple Israel for a Mitzvah Day weekend intergenerational service project to bless the youth at the Summit County Juvenile Detention Facility. Join us on Sunday, June 4th at Temple Israel, located at 91 Springside Drive in Akron from 3.30 to 4.30 p.m. as we come together and create cards with encouraging messages. It will be a time of community, education, and fellowship as dinner will be provided. This is an opportunity for the entire family. Please sign up at mitzvahdayakron.com. If you have additional questions, reach out to Minister Alexandra Star Thomas. Let's get together and serve our community. Whether you graduated magnum cum laude or laude laude, we want to celebrate you on Graduate Sunday, Sunday, June 25th at 10.30 a.m. All high school and college graduates, please send your picture and graduation information to Minister Alexandria Thomas no later than May 31st. Her email is thotlyouthministry at thotl.org. That's thotl youth ministry at t-h-o-t-l dot org. We want to celebrate you. Are you really all in? Then call the church office on Monday at 330-864-9073 and sign up to volunteer for our Community Day. Community Day will be held on Saturday, August 12th. Mark your calendars. On that day, we'll reach out to our community and offer them fun and games. There'll be something for everyone. Golf, three-on-three basketball, line dancers, get in line, face painting, games, and the Kingdom Worship Choir will sing in concert and bring heaven down to earth. But it can't happen without you. We need you. Community Day, Saturday, August 12th, 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. Are you really all in? The number you called is no longer in service. Please check the number and try your call again. Beloved, has your phone number recently changed? You no longer have a landline? Have you moved or have a different email address? Please let us know. We'd like to update your contact information to stay connected to you. Email Deacon Linda Parker at Linda S at T H O T L dot org. That's Linda L Y N D A S at T H O T L dot org. Or call us. Our number hasn't changed at 330 864 9073.
But I was kind of enjoying that. You know. Welcome to the House of the Lord, Sunday, May 28, 2023. If you're online, share the stream with somebody. If you got small children, just sit back a little bit so you can get out if they start to cry, just to be sensitive to those who don't have children. Praise team is, are y'all alive? Yeah. It's coming. Set the atmosphere for praise and worship. Amen, amen. Good morning, house of the Lord. Oh God, we are seeking your presence. We need you each and every day, Lord. And so we're happy, hoping that you will join with us as we ask God to fill this room, fill our hearts, that he would be all around us. Your presence.
Thank you for the gift of your presence. Your presence means everything to us who know you in the pardon of our sin. Father, I would just say I want to be baptized in the Holy Ghost. I want your spirit to fill every part of my being. Your presence is so important in walking this Christian walk and walking with you. I ask you now then, fill me with your spirit. Touch me from the crown of my head to the sole of my feet. Let your spirit pervade and have the right of way. And then anybody else, Lord, who wants to be filled, fill them right now. Fill them from the, from the bottom up. Fill them from the top down until there is a change in their lives. Thank you for another week. Thank you that I'm in my right mind. Thank you I have the activity of my limbs. Thank you for a reasonable portion of health and strength. Thank you for a roof over my head. Thank you for transportation. Thank you for food and clothing. You are worthy of praise today, and I'm glad to magnify you. Now, open our hearts and minds for a few moments for the Word of God. Let your spirit come in and engraft the Word of God in our very being. We may be able to walk it out, live it out every day of our lives. We might be dispensers of your love to the folks who are hurting. And we'll give your name the praise and glory and honor and majesty, dominion and power. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray and we give thanks. Anybody who's not ashamed, go ahead and say praise God. And amen. All right, go ahead and be seated. That, that song was about to get me started. Because I'm reading a new book on baptism and the Holy Ghost. I just decided and sometime this summer I'll start talking about the power that you ought to have, uh, that you want to have, that you need to have. So we'll talk about that. Because we travel a lot, my wife and I are enrolled in the TSA pre-check program. TSA stands for Transportation Security Administration. TSA is an agency of the United States Department of Homeland Security that has authority over the security of transportation systems within and connecting to the United States. It was created as a response to 9-11 attacks to improve airport security procedures and consolidate air traffic and travel security under dedicated federal administrative law enforcement agency. Well, TSA PreCheck is designed to pre-screen those who are low risk and then allow them to enjoy an expedited security screening uh -huh. process. Yes, this is a flight by flight privilege which is signaled by a TSA logo printed on your ticket. If anything is out of order in the ticket purchasing process, the TSA privilege may not be granted. I, my wife and I have flown to Florida, had the TSA on the first part of the ticket, get ready to come back, and it ain't on the second part of the ticket. I'm trying to figure out what happened, and you calling and doing everybody. If you don't have it, guess what? You just don't have it. You may get it the next time but it is a case-by-case -case basis, and they can just not grant it to you for whatever reason they, they want or whatever. My wife, I'm, I'm concerned about her. I don't know if she's a gangster by night or, I'm not sure, because they stop her every time almost. They get out of line, and I'll be like, uh-oh, what has she done? Uh, but, but she normally gets through, but they just need to stop and check her for some reason. I don't know. We'll, we'll figure that out later on. Most airports have a special TSA line where a TSA agent will check your ticket and your identity to ensure compliance and safety. Not only do these procedures ensure safe travel, but they provide convenience when you are 
or have to frequent very busy airports like we do. We go to Orlando a lot. Orlando International is one of the busiest airports in the world. And if you don't have TSA, you could be standing out there for a while. So that's what TSA is about. But did you know that you have your own personal TSA agent? Your autonomic nervous system scans the faces, voices, and body postures of people for clues of safety and danger. Dr. Stephen Porges in his polyvagal theory calls this ability neuroception. Perception is the ability to discern the situation and take information consciously in through your cerebral cortex. Neuroception is your autonomic nervous system's ability to discern and take in safety information automatically unconsciously by detecting the nervous systems of other people. As human beings, we have been designed, whether through creation if you are a Christian, or evolution from a scientist's perspective, to search for clues of safety and danger. We are on a neurobiological quest for safety, and our well-being is built upon that quest for safety. If you do not sense that you are safe, it's difficult to experience calmness, health, growth, and restoration. Before we move forward, allow me to address the evolution creation issue that has impacted many Christians and some of our young people who face a crisis of faith when they are confronted in school by information and teachers who believed that we evolved from lower life forms. Nobody's taught anything much about it in the church. We don't deal with it a lot. So the church, our children are sit in church and we tell them you're created, you're created, you're created. And they go to school and the professor said, you, you weren't created, you evolved. And now they've got to deal with that. And it's not a real problem except when the information of the teacher teaches that the origin of life is science and that there is no creator. Of course, the Bible teaches in the beginning. We're looking for the Bible readers. Where are you? In the beginning, what? God did what? Created the heavens and the earth. And because of the Bible's teaching on creation in the book of Genesis, some Christians have attacked scientific evolution as false. Yet it is obvious that evolution is true at some level because all scientific process is built upon evolutionary principles. So that's not hard to reconcile when you recognize that science doesn't answer big questions or why questions, and religion doesn't answer scientific or how questions. Science answers what questions about phenomenon that are repeatable and testable. Religion asks, answers why questions or big questions about constructs that are not repeatable or testable like love. Science answers how your heart works. Religion tells you why God gave you a heart. Is the mic on? So science is really, it really there is no uh, conflict except for religious people who don't know enough science and scientists who don't know enough Bible. Uh, evolution cannot answer the question, who created life? But the Bible can. So it is possible that there were, are, are you holding on to your seats? That there were various stages of human development until Homo sapiens evolved or were created. So it's possible that when they tell you and go back and say there was Cro-Magnon man and this kind of man and that kind of man until you get to Homo sapiens, there's nothing wrong with that except we know that God created life whatever the scientific uh, process there may be. So I believe, so make sure that you don't leave here and tell a lie on me, that God created life. Even though evolution occurs in various phases of development, I believe that the Bible says that God spoke life into being. God molded Adam and Eve and brought forth life. What a mighty God we serve. 
All right, let me get back to your personal TSA agent. We've been taught in school that human survival was dependent upon the survival of the fittest, which suggests a power struggle, but we've not been taught that scientists like Darwin and Dobzhansky taught that survival of the fittest was not about power, but about cooperation. Aren't you glad you go to the house of the Lord? You get to, to go back and go over stuff so you can understand what was taught in school and what was not taught in school. Because sometimes your education is your miseducation. Carter Woodson, G. Woodson, who was the founder of uh, African American history, wrote a book called The Miseducation of the Negro. Because sometimes what you think you're being educated in is not in fact the truth, but only parts and pieces of what people want you to know in order to brainwash you or to persuade you to believe certain things. That's why they say that if you want to hide something from black people, put it in a book. They'll never find it. Because the average person, not just black people, the average person never reads one book after high school. That's a statistic. Never reads one book after high school is over. Don't have to be guilty. I'm not going to call your name. Don't be there looking at me like this. Because that's just that. That's it. We, we, we studied to get our degree, to get our diploma. We got it. Now I'm done. Theo, Theodore Dobzhansky was a Ukrainian-American geneticist and evolutionist whose work had major influence in the 20th century and, uh, on uh, research of genetics and evolutionary theory. He taught that evolutionary journey defines a core, unique mammalian biological imperative in which survival and health are dependent on social connectedness and the ability to trust and feel safe with another, pe another person. Let me quote, Dobzhansky emphasized it was the capacity to form social bonds rather than physical strength that enabled the evolutionary success of mammals. His statement, another statement was, the fittest may also be the gentlest because survival often requires mutual help and cooperation uh, rather than some kind of power against each other. I said American education is often a miseducation because many of you are looking at me right now and I'm getting old and I got uh, what them things called cataracts so I can't see you real good, but you look like you're looking at me crazy. And you don't know because you've never been taught that. What you've been taught, the survival of the fittest, it's about power. And you got, but actually they taught it was about cooperation. Well. And so we need to be aware of the fact, if you didn't get that, we survive because of cooperation. We survive because we've been imprinted with the ability to determine whether others are safe or dangerous. And I taught you a little bit about that in terms of when we were looking at um, the various signs of friendship and covenant signs that one of them was to hold your hand up so you people could see the covenant mark and know that you are either friendly or you are not friendly. But you have the ability to look at people and discern clues and read their faces and their voices. The autonomic reason or, or does not the automatic uh, autonomic reason does not mean that you are consciously aware of what you are picking up because it takes place in nanoseconds outside of your consciousness. Yet, once our autonomic nervous system detects danger, our physiological state automatically shifts to optimize survival. So you are going into survival whether you are aware of it or not. You don't know what it is exactly that you might be feeling, but you know you ain't feeling right. I'm kind of looking for an amen right there. You ever run into somebody and your gut feeling says? To get away, okay. Don't trust them. Be careful. Be on the lookout. Something's not right here. And what you do is because we are Americans, we try to overthink that. Well, you know, he is a deacon. Okay, like a deacon ain't never done nothing to nobody. Or he, well, you know, he, he is an usher. He, 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 he does belong to our church. And therefore, that I'm overthinking the fact that my gut tells me that something is not right. And how many of you know that when your gut tells you something, you be more, you be predisposed to listen? 
Now, your mind and your thoughts can go all kinds of stuff, but your gut will say, hey, you know, and your intuition will tell you. So although we are not aware of the clues, perhaps, or that trigger neuroception, we are aware of some kind of physiological shift. It's called interception. Are y'all, are y'all allowed to touch anybody yet? Or are you still scared? Okay, you can touch your own family member, right? You don't want to touch him neither? Okay. Just touch him and say, wake up, we're trying to learn something here. Interception is defined as one's perception and awareness and understanding of the physiological state of the body, including changes therein. In other words, you are aware of certain things that happen in your body, even though you may not be able to identify them, even though you may not be able to put a feeling on them, you are aware that something has shifted, something has changed. And sometimes the experience uh, is a feeling or a gut feeling or an intuition that the context is dangerous. Praise God, we don't have to accurately identify or be conscious of our feelings for them to do their work. Praise God, you don't have to be accurate. You don't have to look and know for sure, but your body kicks in and your autonomic nervous system reads the situation and therefore it does the work. Your your autonomic nervous system kicks in. Your heart rate begins to go up. Your breathing changes. Chemicals begin to course through your body. Everything gets in gear. We are fearfully and wonderfully made. Think about it for a moment. You're driving, somebody pulls out in front of you. You don't have to say, "Uh uh-oh, somebody just pulled in front of me. Because if you did that, what would happen? You would wreck. By the time you responded, it would be too late. But your body said, boom, 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 boom. And you've already swerved and moved and gone on. And now, later on, your feelings catch up. After it's over, now you start breathing hard. <sighs> your heart starts beating. Your, 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 your breathing comes up into your throat because your body is compensating now. It is already compensating. You're becoming aware of the compensation in order for you to survive. Now, remember, I already taught you. Now, we'll go back and I'll cover it again later on. It'll be a lot of repetition so you can get it. You, it's not ultimately for you to survive, but ultimately for you to come into contact with God. Ultimately for you to enter in relationship with him. But it's a part of a survival mechanism because guess what? If you don't survive, you can't be in contact with God. But it's ultimately, that's what it's about. So you have these survival, wonderful survival mechanisms that kick in. And sometimes we don't know what to do with them. We're not sure how to respond. And we're not sure how to operate because of how they can, what can take place. And I'm going to talk about that in a minute. So what's remarkable and important to know is that these trigger physiological states that support trust, social engagement behaviors, and building of strong relationships. So... If you are in danger, you can't build any relationships. If you're in danger, you can't connect with people in pro-social behaviors in a healthy way. If you feel that you're in danger, you are disconnected, disassociated. You may be in fight or flight, or if it's a life threat, you may be shut down. So this is our first attempt to deal with danger starts with flock and fellowship. I call it flock. Some scientists call it flock. I've added fellowship to it to come to correspond to fight or flight or to freeze or faint. So the first thing I try to do is I try to be your friend. Amen? Amen. I walk up to you. You ain't looking real safe. And you're not looking real welcoming. I don't know why y'all looking at me crazy. I'm talking about church people right now. They, they say, but they're treacherous. They say, but they're dangerous. And they, you look at them and you say, uh-oh. And you walk over and try to interact with them. Well, well, good morning. How are you? And they say, uh. And you say, uh-oh. I'm going to have to protect myself. So therefore, you shift, your body shifts into fight 
and flight. So either you're going to cuss them out or you're going to run. You leave. You just say, I, I, I don't have time for this. And you walk away. You flee. But, but you may want to engage. Is there something wrong? Did I say something wrong to you? Then why are you not talking to me? Okay, because some of y'all are, are kind of, you know, you want to confront people. You know, you, 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 you're not real good and saved. You're saved, but there's a, some stuff that still needs to be saved underneath there. And some of you may have your hand on your switchblade. I don't know, you know. You know, I, you know, I don't know. I don't know what's going on inside of you. I don't know what's happening. But, but you're trying to get ready for what's going on. So the problem becomes, are y'all hearing me? Okay, unfortunately, neuroception is not always accurate. Faulty neuroception might be an adaptive survival reaction that biases it towards detecting risk when there is no risk or identifying cues of safety when there is risk. Individuals with a trauma history frequently experience a biased neuroception. Many people sense relational danger when there is none. Yeah, somebody said it back there. What did you say? Wow. Because that means you're interacting with folks and you think you're in danger, but there's no danger. That's the reason we'll talk a little bit about, a bit about why some people quit coming to church. Why? They think they're in danger. Now, they don't know. You just mean. You're not dangerous. You just mean. Now, meanness can be danger to some people. I don't think y'all heard me, did you? What did I say? Meanness can be danger to some people if I've been treated in certain ways where my neuroception has been biased and, and I've been in situations where I've been abused or misused. Your, your meanness can be dangerous to me. But for most of us, that's not the case. You're, you don't have a high ACEs score, adverse childhood experiences score. And so therefore, but, but you misread that the person is mean, that they're, they're, they're after you, they don't like you or whatever. They're, they're mean to everybody. They're not just mean to you. They're mean to the first person before you, to mean to the person after you. They're mean to the people around you. They're just mean. But you're reading it as a personal meanness. Evidently, he don't like me. And so that becomes the thing that you begin to do. Many people sense that people are trustworthy when they, in fact, are dangerous. That's a, certainly a church phenomenon where we come to church and because you happen to be a member or because you happen to be a, in ministry or whatever it is, I assume that you are safe because you are here. You cannot assume that somebody is safe simply because they are occupying a certain position. There are plenty of people that are in positions that they are unsafe even though they ought to be safe. One of the ones that I'm uh, particularly thinking about today is the one that I've had a lot of interaction with lately, and that is with the medical community. And some of the medical community are not safe. They have no bedside manner. They don't listen very well. Okay, and uh, that you say, you would think you would learn that in school. There's certain things that you can learn. There's certain things we can teach you. There's certain things that you have to have. I can teach you certain kind of skills, but if you don't have a heart, I may not be able to teach you that. I may, be, may not be able to teach you how to love people. I may, not, I may not be able. Is anybody getting anything? So that's one reason I'm teaching this information, to help you heal your autonomic nervous system so that you can have life and so you can have it more abundantly. Otherwise, you may be shut off bias towards defense because of your autonomic nervous system. Trauma retunes your autonomic nervous system towards, are y'all listening? Exhaustion, confusion, 
sadness, anxiety, agitation, numbness, disassociation, physical arousal, difficulty expressing emotions, sleep disorders, nightmares, fear of the trauma happening again, withdrawal, lashing out verbally and physically, flashbacks, depression. All of this can be part of how trauma is impacting you and how it is having that kind of effect upon you. So I'm also this will help you because many of you are living with traumatized people and looking at their behavior and not able to understand why they're behaving the way they're behaving. Now, before you go home and apply this to your mate, first make sure you start with yourself. Because I saw some of y'all right there. I know how y'all do. Are you listening? I'm not preaching to your mate. I'm preaching to you. You first check yourself. First look at the beam in your own eye before you try to take the moat out of somebody else's eye. First try to deal with your own. I'm trying to help somebody. And so what's going on is that we come to church, we have church, and many of us are suffering these symptoms in silence. And nobody will talk about it. Many of us are on antidepression, anti-anxiety, and psychotropic medications. Psychotropic medications are substances that affect the mind, mood, or behavior of a person. These medications are sometimes necessary. Never make fun. One time we had somebody come in and they kind of try to poo-poo that you don't need that. Just pray. You know, we're going to lay hands on you. That's good. We will lay hands on you. We will pray for you. We do believe in, in divine healing. We do that. But we also believe in medicine. Okay? And medicine can be effective in certain situations. And we should not be ashamed that we are on the medicine. But we ought to be aware that medicines don't cure the impact and symptoms of trauma. Rather, they mask them and they hide them. And that can often lead to addiction. I've had one person that I interacted with who decided that I'm not going to take any more blood pressure medicine because I'm, I believe God's going to heal me. Okay? And I, unfortunately, they're dead because they developed an aneurysm and died. Why? Because they were waiting on God to do something that he's already done in medicine. I think I'm losing all my amen. Okay, so while you praying, you know, so while I'm praying that God will, we're going to keep on praying. Believe in God and take your blood pressure medicine while you're praying. And if he's going to work, he can work through that. And also he can work and bring it down and maybe you can get off. But lo don't be foolish. These medications are sometimes necessary. I have an anti-anxiety -med medication myself. I have not taken it but once and only little pieces of it just because I don't want to be addicted. I'm crazy enough. I don't need to add addiction on to my issues. I have issues enough and then go get addicted? I, I'm not willing to do that. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm monitoring it. I'm looking at it. Give me something that is at the least addictive as possible. I'll try it out. I will test. And a lot of times, a lot of you don't know this because you have been brought up in a medical environment where you, you, you are not allowed to talk back to the doctor or to share with the doctor what's going on. It's your body. I'm not getting an amen. amen. It's your body. Amen. You got to make the final decision. Amen. Somebody told me, but they're the expert. They're the expert in their field. They ain't the expert on your body. Amen. Only you know your body. And you don't need to determine what's going to happen. So I go, I listen, I read all up about it, and then I try to do what they ask me to do. But when it starts to have a, a crazy impact upon me, I just stop. And then they call, I call in and say, well, you know, this medicine had this impact. They said, Mr. Johnson, okay. They call back a day later, you can stop. I said, okay. 
already done stopped. Okay, I don't need you to tell me that that's causing me to be crazy and that I'm going to have to pull back while I consult, continue to consult, and do what I need to do because you have to be able to be your own advocate. I'm trying to help somebody in those situations. I know you don't know this. I'm going to say it because I'm, I'm up here and I'm almost done. But, uh, but, but there are some times when you don't look, you're not careful, you, know, you get the wrong medication. And you ain't looking and you ain't paying attention what a doctor said. You better read. So many of us are suffering these symptoms in silence. What can we do to counteract and heal from the impact and the symptoms of trauma? That's what I really want to talk about. And you say, well, why don't you talk about it then? Because at first I got to tell you what, I'm t what the issues are before I can help you then to begin to deal with how we deal with those issues. In my reading of numerous books on neuroscience and trauma, many scientists and doctors recognize now that relationships are central to healing. What did I just say? Now we're in the realm of the Bible because the Bible is about healing relationships that you can have with God, that you can have with others that we can have with ourselves, and that we can have with creation. Let's go on to John 10 and 10. The thief comes only to steal and, and, I came that you might have, and have it how? More abundantly. Anybody want abundant life? Anybody, I'm looking for abundant. I want to live abundantly. That's what my ministry is about, helping people live abundantly, psychologically, emotionally, physically, spiritually, economically, every way God wants to bless you. Sometimes we don't know that, and so we're only dealing with certain folks. And remember, if you come from other the the theological tradition, they believe it's all intellectual. God wants to save your soul, but nothing else. Not in the Bible I'm reading. Bible I read, he don't just want to save my soul, he wants to bless me. He wants to bless me. He wants to heal my body. He wants to bless my finances. He wants to change my relationship. He wants to do and give me abundant life in every facet of my existence. And so I'm going to teach that until you get it and be walking in the, the, the prosperity that God wants you to have. Now, that doesn't mean you're not going to have any problems. It doesn't mean you're not going to have any troubles. It doesn't mean you're not going to run into some difficulty. But he said, lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. Without God, I don't know if I'd be standing here or not. Without God, I would have lost my mind. Without God, I wouldn't be doing as good as I'm doing. I'm doing good because God is on my side. I'm doing good because when I come home, the Lord comes in and begins to walk with me. I'm doing good because after I done about lost my mind, he comes in and says, no, I'm not done with you yet. You can't lose your mind. And then the other thing that's really helping me right now is I, I, I got lots of, of disciples. I mean, even beyond the house of the Lord. And they're calling me up right now, and they're declaring a thing. They're calling me up saying, Bishop, you can't die. You can't die. I need you. You can't die. Maybe in about 20 years, I'll let you go. But right now, you can't die. In the name of Jesus, I rebuke the death spirit off of you in the name of Jesus. I rebuke that off of you and it cannot have any dominion over your life. Hallelujah. 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 We're talking about power. And I'm going to go back sometime here because I'm studying it right now and I'm going to begin to talk about power so that people can understand not just not just power to be a witness, but, uh, but all kinds of power 
that the Bible talks about. I want you to notice that when he says, I come that you might have life and have it more abundantly, he's not treating us as thinking things. He didn't say and tell us this is something you need to think about or this is something you need to learn. He said, I come, I, that you might have life and have it what? An experiential relationship. I'm coming so that you can trust me and be made better. You get better when you interact with the right people. I said you get better when you interact with the right people. Some of y'all are having difficulty because you're saying, well, I got some people that they're not right. Well, then get rid of them. Walk away. Don't be walking with folks who are crazy and, and slew-footed and not need and having all kinds of problems and don't want to live right and, and cussing you out or whatever. Pack your grip and go. Move on. I'm done. Can't do that. I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to give the power of my life to somebody who's doing that kind of stuff. Now, maybe, now wait a minute now, because some of y'all, well, I'm the, you want to get rid of everybody. If you're trying to get rid of everybody, then look in the mirror. It's probably you. You're looking out the window, look in the mirror. So we have been specifically dealing with those of us who have been traumatized. But I want to note that Dr. Porges says that we are a traumatized species. There are so many traumatized people suffering in silence that I want to offer help. And one of the foremost experts on trauma, Dr. Bessel van der Kolk, says that most psychologists are not helping people, but rather are simply masking the symptoms of trauma, which may eventually make the impact worse. Van der Kolk says in his excellent book, The Body Keeps the Score, traumatized human beings recover in the context of relationships with families, loved ones, AA meetings, veterans of organization, religious communities, professional therapists, end of quote. Did you get it? We, cover, we recover in the context of relationships. What kind of relationship? Family relationships can be healing. Relationships with loved ones can be healing. Relationships at your AA meeting can be healing. Relationships at the veterans organization can be healing. Relationships in your religious communities come to church um, can be healing. Your relationship with your professional Christian therapists can be healing. And we still have got to get over the stigma of seeking out mental health. I said we still got to get over the stigma of seeking out mental health. Where we, if you need help, you need help. Go get some help. If you need medication, take your medication. Do what you need to do and then pray. And I'm going to go ahead and say it. I shouldn't say it, but I'm going to go ahead and say it. Maybe even fast. I think I about cleared the room there, didn't I? Now, this is particularly challenging because sometimes the very relationships that ought to be healing are unhealthy, are challenging, are, are abusive. And this may cause us to flee all relationships, the only context where we can heal. This is why some people stop coming to church. They get hurt where they should get help. And let me say it again. I said they get hurt where they should get help. But can I say something to y'all? I'm almost done. You, you ain't got to leave, but I'm almost done. Can I just say a couple more things? Say yes so I can get out of here. Thank you. Thank you. When you don't say yes, it makes me drone on ad infinitum, ad nauseum. You can't stop going to the grocery store because you got some spoiled meat. And you can't stop going to church because you got some spoiled saints. I think somebody didn't get that, did you? You get some spoiled meat. Do you quit going to the grocery store? No, what do you do? First of all, you go back there cussing folks out. I bought some D meat up in here, and, it, and it's spoiled, and I want my money back. 
Okay, you ain't, you, you don't, it, you don't, not, you ain't going to go back. You're willing to go back, but you understand that you can get spoiled meat. Huh? When you come to church and you run into some spoiled saints, don't go home and don't come back. Just walk around them next time. Come and talk to the, the deacons and whatever and say, I want my money back. I've been coming and I've been, I'm giving and these folks ain't acting right. I'm attempting to teach you the role of relationships with respect to healing trauma. The role of those relationships is to provide physical and emotional safety, including safety from feeling shame. You shouldn't have to come to church and feel shamed. You shouldn't have to come to church and feel admonished. You shouldn't have to come to church and feel judged. And I'm trying to help you to bolster your courage to tolerate faith and process the reality of what has happened. And what happens is many of us, even though sometimes you're in a place where you need to leave, you won't leave because you've been taught I ought to just stay and suffer. Much of the wiring of our brain is devoted to being in tune with others. Recovery from trauma involves connecting with other human beings. That's why trauma that has occurred within relationship is more difficult to treat than trauma from traffic accidents or natural disasters. In our society, the most common trauma is women and children occur at the hands of parents and intimate partners. Child abuse, molestation, domestic violence are all inflicted by people who are supposed to love us that knocks out the most important protection against being traumatized, being sheltered by the people that you love. Pastor Darren, this could be my last sermon series. Get ready. So let me summarize. Let us love and transmit love to everybody we encounter. I'm going to say some stuff here. I'm almost done, but I'm going to say some stuff because I'm going to have to run anyway. Be like Paul when we run. Some of us are just negative, critical people. And we sit around and criticize folks rather than loving them. Unfortunately, we are autonomically transmitting the psychological state that we are in. That means that we need to become as healthy as possible because, uh, so that our personal TSA agents are healed and we're able to transmit safety and calm to other people's personal TSA agents. You got to get healed so you don't end up transmitting inadvertently your negativity. I'm waiting on an amen. Some of y'all say, well, I don't know that I'm negative. You got any friends? Just go over there one day and say, tell me the truth. Am I negative? Okay, now, if you don't want the answer, don't go ask. Because when they tell you, then you want to swing on them. That's not me. That's me. That's not the way I am. You ask me. Have you ever figured, let me, let me wait a minute, I've got to stop a minute. Have you, have you, maybe some of y'all have experienced this. I've been around a long time in the church. People ask you for information and then don't want it. So what do you think about this? And I'm looking at that, they don't want the answer. I know I should not give them the answer. But sometimes I just ain't got no sense. I'm going to go ahead and do it anyway. And then as soon as I do... So we're talking about co-regulation. We've been taught, regulate yourself, regulate yourself. You need to get yourself in order. You need to check yourself before you wreck yourself. You need to, you need to, you know, 
co-regulation. Most of the time, you cannot regulate yourself. You need to get with somebody who is regulated, and they help you regulate, and then you get straightened out. Why? Because they're calm, you become more calm. Because they're messed up uh, or, or with you, you don't have, you're not as messed up as you were. And I'm going to talk about what that looks like with, the, with respect to, to compassion, because sometimes what we call compassion is nothing more than belly aching. We get with other folk, and, and they, they you, you had a bad day? Me too. Devil been on your track? Me too. Let's, let me just share. Let's commiserate. You know, sometimes you're just getting together, and you're down. But I need somebody who can pull me up. I need somebody who can say, come on up. I love you. Come on up. I'm with you. Come on up. I'm for you. God's going to do better. He's going to lift you. God, it's not over. I need somebody who's calm. I need somebody who's caring. And when that happens, it allows me to shift, to down-regulate, to down-shift out of fight and flight back into flock and fellowship. I can downshift. So I'm teaching you how to do that so you can do it. I, I don't, I mean, really, 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 I, I, I don't need no Bible scriptures. I already read the Bible today. Just, just try to relate to me. Try to feel where I am. Try to just share a little bit of what I'm going through. I said I'm in pain. Don't tell me I ought not to be in pain. That's how some of well you you shouldn't you just ought not to be. You know why you know why why you doing that? You got God on your side. You ain't got no reason to be down. I'm not asking for correction. I'm not asking for judgment. I'm, not, I'm asking you to have compassion, to feel what I feel, to relate to where I am. Is anybody hearing me today? What would this church look like if we were doing that? It would go, it would go back to full even in the face of COVID. Why? Because people are hurting and they need somebody to come. So Jesus would simply say, let me end it like this. Love one another. Loving one another is the most powerful way to help others who are traumatized and heal, help them heal their personal TSA agents. Love one another. Love one another. When you start from the pool, from the parking lot up into these pews, love one another. When you run into people and they look like they're having a difficult time, love one another. When you see folks and they look a little messed up and down on it, all you need to do is what? Love one another. And it will change. It will transform. It will heal the autonomic nervous systems of those people. Now remember one thing before, before I quit. Don't think it's going to be automatic. Amen. Amen. I was let down by my mama. Well. I was let down by my father. Well. I was let down by my friends. Come on. I ain't talking personal. I'm just talking. Yes, sir. That's where many people are. Uh -huh. I've been let down, let down, let down, let down, let down. And then you come and say, I love you. And guess how, how I look at you? What do you want? What is that real? How do, you're going to have to stay there a while for that person to begin to take in the love and it begin to make a difference. Love one another. Love. That's all Jesus would say. Love one another. Now's the day of salvation. Come.
you, Jesus. Oh, I'm preaching right now. Woo. A lot of folks would be like, well, Bishop, I'll be glad when you start preaching. That's what I'm doing. I'm preaching right now. I'm not hollering. I'm not shouting. I'm not running across the state. I'm proclaiming truth that can set you free. You will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. If you don't know Jesus, would you? Would you just please pray to receive him and say, Lord Jesus, I'm sorry. For every sin that I've sinned against you, come in my life, save me. Make me the person you want me to be. Thank you for dying on the cross for me and giving me the gift of eternal life. I receive you as Savior and Lord. It's a hard transaction between you and God if you prayed it in a minute. He's not a man that he should lie nor change his mind. He saved you. Call the church tomorrow. If you need a church home, do that same thing. We want to bless you. We want to make sure you know what it means. For those who are glad that God has, is your friend and that he walks with you, just give him a hand clap right quick. Are there some here that will say, I need some help emotionally. I need some help psychologically, head bowed, eye closed. I need God to step in and help me right now. I need help with my medication. I need help regulating my emotions. I need help. Just slip your hand up and put it back down. I'll see it wherever you are. I need some help. God bless you. I see your hands. I need some help. Now, what I want you to do is open yourself up. I'm going to pray for you right now that God's going to give you that help with glory to God, which you need right now. Don't worry about anybody else. Don't worry about how they think or how, what they might be looking at or whatever. Say, I need you. Oh, I need you. In your heart, in your mind right now, Father, in the name of Jesus, let divine healing flow from the wounded side of your son, Jesus. I believe in the power of prayer. And I pray right now that there is a divine flow of the Holy Ghost in this room. And that folks are being healed psychologically, emotionally, intellectually. And Lord, I'm gonna go ahead and pray physically. Let some physical healing begin to go right now. Let blood pressure be uh, supernaturally regulated. Let some heart stuff get straightened out right now and doctors not know how it took place. Let there be all kinds of physical, emotional, psychological healing in this place. I believe it and I'm going to call it done in Jesus' name. So now, I want to thank you in advance that you are already beginning to let healing flow in this place. What a mighty God you are. If you're one of those that slipped your hand up, don't let nobody thank God for you. You thank God for yourself. Father, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for being a prayer answering healing God. Whatever is accomplished, we'll say yes to your will. In Jesus' name we pray. Come on, somebody say praise God. Amen. Thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for your electronic giving. And if you're giving when you leave, thank you for that. Don't forget Wednesday services are on the Facebook page, YouTube channel, website on Wednesday. At 7 p.m., we are having and broadcasting those services. God is good. I said God is good. I want you to just go ahead and stand on your feet as we make this affirmation. 
As we give today's offering, we proclaim on the basis of Habakkuk, I got to yet pray. Therefore, despite economic depression, sad circumstances, food shortages, stock market, unemployment, gasoline prices, housing market, terrorism, pandemic, yet will I praise you. Praise you with my manners, my mouth, my material, my walk, my words, my worship, my practices, my pronouncement, and a portion of my paycheck. I got to yet pray. And I affirm that yet praise with the highest praise word. Hallelujah. Give thanks with a grateful heart. Give thanks to the Holy One. Give thanks because He's given Jesus Christ His Son. Give thanks with a grateful heart. Give thanks to the Holy One. Give thanks because He's given Jesus Christ. Come on, sing somebody. And now, and now, let the weak say I am strong. Let the poor say I am rich because of what the Lord has done for us. And now let the weak say I'm strong. Let the poor say I am rich because of what the Lord has done for us. Give thanks. Give thanks. If you give thanks this week, Thanks will change your attitude. Thanks will change your altitude. Thanks will change a lot of stuff. Have a good week. Don't forget about Wednesday night. We'll see you.